uh, today we're going to talk about significant figures, um, which is a major component of measuring. All right, and really when we measure a piece, um, we, when we take measurements off an instrument, um, significant figures are the way we use to determine what of those numbers in the measurement are significant and which ones are insignificant. All right, um, so here we go with significant figures. There are going to be four, four bullets on this slide. The first three have to do when numbers are significant, and the last one is when they are not. All right, so non-zero numbers are significant every single time. And here is an example. We have a number 1.234 kilograms. You might read this off a scale. But because all the numbers are not zero, this number, or this measurement, has four sig figs. All right? Or you might call them sig digs, but four of them. All right, what I call sandwich zeros are significant. Okay? So if it's not zero, it's always significant. So really we need to determine when are zeros significant and when are they not. So sandwich zeros are significant. And sandwich zeros are just zeros between significant numbers. So we have 606. This 6 is significant because it's not zero. That is significant. All right, so we have two pieces of bread and we have a piece of meat, a vegetarian, a piece of lettuce. Uh, if you like real cheese, there's some cheese right there. But regardless, we have three sig figs in this measurement. All right, our next rule. Trailing zeros after a decimal are significant. So by trailing zeros, I mean those zeros at the end. So if there's a decimal place, look and see if there's zeros at the end. And if there are, we are going to count them as being significant. So here's another number. We might get this off a scale again. 0 0.00420 grams. All right, so this is significant. That is significant. And this zero right here, that's all this definition is telling us about. This zero must be significant because it's a trailing zero and it's after a decimal place. All right, so this number we're going to say has three sig figs. All right, our other rule relates to this example I just gave you. But leading zeros are never significant. Okay? Leading zeros are never significant. So in this example, 0 0.08 liters, okay? Leading zeros are zeros at the front of our number. So this is at the front, it's not significant. This is at the front, it's not significant. So we have an 8, so we have 1 sig fig. Um, the other thing is, let's just do this one. Trailing zeros are significant after a decimal. If we had this number, 600 grams, okay? Six is significant because it's not zero. These are trailing zeros, but is there a decimal? No, there's not, so they are not significant. So this would have one sig fig again, okay? All right, so we're gonna do a little bit of practice. How many sig figs are in each of the following measurements? First one, 24 milliliters. There's no zeros. So two. Um, our next one, 3,001 grams. Significant, significant. And I happen to have two pieces of my sandwich between my bread. So we have four sig figs. Um, next, I've got a really small number. Okay, so I have some leading zeros, which are never significant. And I have a trailing zero after a decimal. So all those that are left are significant. We have three. And then here, 6.4 times 10 to the fourth molecules. Really, our measurement is this portion only, this number that's between 1 and 10. So in this case, we have two non zeros and we have two sig figs. And then lastly, 560 kilograms. Significant, significant. We have a trailing number. Is it after a decimal? It is not, so not significant. We are back to two. All right. If you have questions on this, um, on homework, feel free to ask those. Um, but that is sig figs really, really, really quickly. All right. When it becomes important for us is when we add, subtract, multiply, and divide. So addition and subtraction. Here's our rule. The answer that we get when we add or subtract cannot have more digits to the right of the decimal than any of the original numbers. All right, so here is our example. We're going to have these two values, 89.332 grams and 1.1 gram. Okay, so if we look at this first number, how many decimal places do we go to? We have three 
decimal places. This number we have one decimal place. So if we go back to our definition, the answer cannot have more digits to the right of the decimal than any of the original numbers. So our second number only has one, where our first number has three. So our answer must only go to one. So this column is not significant. That column is not significant. So 90.4 grams is our answer. And we're going to put a grams right there. All right, our next example is going to be subtraction. And we have 3.70 centimeters. So that has two decimal places. We have 2.9133 centimeters, which has four decimal places. So which one has less? Our top one. Or if we just look at columns, if we line our decimals up, these don't count. This does. But however, once we look at our calculator and get an answer, this 8, if we look at the number after it, is a 6. So it's really going to round that 8 up. So even though we don't count this number, it will still be considered with rounding. All right, so we have 0.79 centimeters. All right, multiplication or division. The number of sig figs in the result is the same or is set by the original number that has the smallest number of sig figs. And again, if you go back to like fourth grade or fifth grade, uh, probably not fourth or fifth, probably third or fourth when you did longhand multiplication and division, um, rationale for this is solid. And again, I can show this in class. Um, I don't think I need to take time on it on a podcast. But if we look at this number, how many sig figs does it have? They're all non-zero, so this has three. This number, they're all non-zero, has five. So our answer, this is what your calculator is going to give you, has to have three significant figures. So I'm going to keep the one, I'm going to keep the six, I'm going to keep the five, which means I don't need any of these. Um, is the three going to do anything to my five? It is not. So our answer is just 16.5. And if we divide, this number's got two, this number has five, so my answer has to have two. Okay, so is this zero significant? No, it's leading. Is this zero significant? No, it's leading. Is this one? Yep, so that's my first sig fig. And this zero, what's going to happen with this six? It's actually going to get, well, this last zero is my last significant column. Okay, so are, am I going to leave it at zero? No, because this six right here, is after the zero. It's going to round that zero up, but I'm not going to keep any of these numbers. So really my rounded answer is 0 0.061. Okay? All right, exact numbers. Numbers from definitions or numbers of objects are considered to have an infinite number of significant figures. So when we say one meter equals 100 centimeters, both of those numbers have infinite numbers of Sig, sig figs. They are exact numbers. It's a definition. Okay, So you would never round a number to have one significant figure if you were just converting from meters to centimeters. Um, another example, the average of these three measurements, 6.64, 6.68, 6.67. So what do we do with these? We add them together. And because they all have two decimal places, our answer is going to have two decimal places. All right? And then we're going to divide by 3. But kind of if we look at the numbers that we start with, at the beginning of our what we took measurements of, we had 3 sig figs, 3 sig figs, 3 sig figs. So our answer should have 3, okay? Not 7, okay? So this 3 does not mean 1, one sig fig. Because it is an average, it is an exact number. So this is our correct answer. All right, accuracy and precision. How close a measurement is to the true value is how we would define accuracy. Precision is how close a set of measurements are to each other. So typically in lab, you'll do, you know, you might run an experiment, do it two or three times, and hopefully by doing it three times, you'll find that two of your answers, hopefully at least two of them, come up with the same thing. That's why we don't do an experiment twice. If we have differing answers, we don't know which one's the correct one. If we do it three times, hopefully two of our three answers will match, and we can throw out the one that doesn't and call it an outlier, and maybe have to explain what we did wrong to cause it to be high, low, or whatever. So this kind of graphical representation, this first bullseye on the left shows someone who hit the mark. We're going to assume they're aiming at the center because they're playing bullseye, and they did it pretty consistently. There's five all right there at the bullseye. So this is both accurate and precise. Our second one we had someone that was really precise, okay? They hit the same spot over and over and over again. Did they hit where they were aiming? Probably not. They should have moved a little bit to the left. They probably ducked down a little bit so they would have been hitting a little bit shorter.
All right, so precise but not accurate. In this last one, you know, it was just somebody, maybe they were blindfolded, I don't know what happened. But regardless, they were terrible. So neither accurate nor precise. All right, the last thing we're covering in podcast 1.3 is dimensional analysis of solving problems. I will typically refer to this as fence and rail. Um, it's how I call it in my general chem classes, and it is just what comes out of my mouth when I am talking about dimensional analysis. Um, but in this method, we need to determine which unit factors are needed. All right, um, carry units through calculation, and if all the units cancel except for the desired units, then the problem was solved correctly. All right, so if, let's just go here real quick. I think I have an example. I don't. Uh, it's going to be on the next page. It is. Okay. So real quick, how this works is, if we have this relationship, 1 meter equals 100 centimeters. Okay? And I want to divide both sides by 1 meter. All right? So I'm just going to set this up as 1 meter. And if I divide the left by a meter, I have to divide the right by a meter. Okay? So in doing this, what does this thing equal, this relationship? Well, because it's equal to 1 meter over 1 meter, what's anything over itself? It is 1. So 100 centimeters over 1 meter is equivalent to 1. Likewise, if we set this up as 1 meter equals 100 centimeters, and divide both sides by 100 centimeters, and I ask the same question, what is this relationship equal? Well, because it's equal to 100 centimeters over 100 centimeters, it must equal 1 as well. Okay? So 100 centimeters over a meter, or 1 meter over 100 centimeters, both those um, quotients are equal to 1. All right. So that sets us up for this. How many milliliters are in 1.63 liters? This is a problem you can very, very easily do in your head, but the problems get much more difficult, so we're going to set this up. Start with what we know. So step one, 1.63 liters. Okay? And now we're going to divide by, or we're going to multiply by some quotient. Okay? So our two really, our two relationships are going to be either this or this. One liter over a thousand milliliters, and we know that this equals one, or a thousand milliliters over one liter. Okay? So if we look at what we start with, we have liters in the numerator spot. So what I'm going to say is, think of Jiminy Cricket from what, um, Pinocchio. Okay, and what's he famous for? Let your units. He really says, let your conscience be your guide. But what we say in chemistry is, let your units be your guide. Okay, so think of Jiminy Cricket sitting on your shoulder, your Pinocchio, and instead of whispering, let your conscience be your guide, which is really great, great words to live by. Think he's think of him saying, let your units be your guide. So liters is in the top, which means liters has to be in the bottom. Okay? Because we want liters to cancel out. Okay? So which of these are we going to choose? We're going to choose the one on the right. That says one liter equals one thousand milliliters. Alright? So mathematically, we're going to multiply this quotient, which is just over one, times a thousand milliliters over a liter, and we're going to get sixteen hundred and thirty. Okay? And really we're going to have liters times milliliters all over liters. So what happens to liters, they cancel, and we're really just left with 1,630 milliliters. Here's our conversions. And again, it kind of goes and shows you here is what doesn't work. Okay? If you don't let your units be your guide, you get really, really crazy units like liters squared over milliliters, which is bad. All right, so Pinocchio has great words of wisdom for science people like you. Um, the speed of sound in air is about 343 meters per second. What is this in miles per hour? All right, we're going to let this pull up some conversion factors for us. Um, one mile equals 1,609 meters. And then obviously a minute has 60 seconds and an hour has 60 minutes. So if we set this up, I'm going to start a little more difficult this time. 343 meters over seconds. Okay, And really we're going to have a series of quotients. I think we probably need three of them. And again, we're going to let our units be our guide. So we have meters on top, which means we want meters on bottom. 
Okay, and what do meters relate to? They relate to miles. So now we're just going to fill in our numbers. One mile equals 1,609 meters. Okay? And we might cross meters out. So right now we have miles per second. We don't want miles per second. We want miles per hour. So seconds are in the denominator, which means we want seconds in the numerator. And we can go from seconds to minutes. What is that relationship? There are 60 seconds in a minute. All right? And then lastly, so right now seconds are gone, and we have miles per minute. But we don't want miles per minute. We want miles per hour. So we have minutes in the denominator which means we need to cancel that with minutes in the numerator. And there are 60 minutes and one hour. Minutes are gone. So if we look at just our units left, okay, as we multiply across, we have miles per hour, which is what we want. And really, we're going to take 343 times 60 times 60 and divide that by 1,609. And I don't know, I think just off the top of my head, I know it's around 740-ish. I don't have a calculator but we're around that. Okay, speed of sound is around 740 miles per hour. That's when you have a sonic boom and glass breaks and people lose their hearing. Okay? Alright, last thing. What is the density of gold in pounds per gallon? Crazy question. Well, if you look it up online, here is what the density of gold is listed as. 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter. Okay? which is a density which makes sense in metric if you're anywhere in the world except for the US this makes sense okay but let's convert this to pounds per gallon you know what a gallon looks like you might have a gallon of milk in the fridge so if we had a gallon of gold what would that weigh all right well here is its density so again we're going to start with what we know so 19.3 grams over cubic centimeters all right and we're just going to kind of do some stuff, do some conversions as we go. So grams, so we're going to put grams down here, and we're going to go to pounds. And I know that a pound equals 454 grams. How come? Because I'm a science geek, and you have silly stuff like that stuck in your head. Okay? So a pound equals 454 grams. Grams are gone. And now we have pounds per cubic centimeter. All right, from yesterday's lecture, or your previous lecture, um, we know that a cubic centimeter is the same as a milliliter. So cubic centimeters in the numerator because they're already in the denominator. And now we have pounds per milliliter. All right. Next, we need to go from probably milliliters to liters. Okay, and what is that relationship? Well, one liter has a thousand milliliters in it. So milliliters are gone, and now we have pounds per liter. And then our last kind of goofy thing is liters to gallons. And a liter is pretty close to, um, I'm sorry, um, a liter is about a quart, okay? Um, not quite, it's really um, 3.785 liters in a gallon, okay? So a little bit more than, or a little bit less than a quart, a little bit more than a quart because there's less of them. All right, so again, what cancels? Liters cancel, and we are left with pounds over gallons. So pounds per gallon. And if we do this math, we find out that a gallon of gold would weigh 161 pounds. It is really, really, really dense. The crazy thing is because gold is selling for around $1,500 ounce right now. There's 16 ounces in a gallon. So who cares how much it weighs? We just want to know what it's worth. So if you had a gallon of gold, you'd have about 24 grand. And that is what chemistry is all about, is making lots of money, especially if we could convert stuff into gold, which is what really what chemistry got its, um, was alchemy. And really the first chemists were alchemists trying to figure out how to make gold out of stuff that wasn't worth anything. So anyways, that's it.